Well, good morning, South Union, and to all of our online viewers, welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day, and welcome to each and every one of you who is here with us today. Our scripture reading for today comes from Revelation chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, and it reads like this, The one who conquers, I will grant them to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and for your love. We thank you so much for your strength and for your kindness. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be with us now and be present to us. Father, we thank you so very much for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for his life and his death on the cross, for the resurrection. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and well and seated at the right hand of God. Now, Father, in Jesus, we pray that your Holy Spirit might be in us and with us and with all those who are watching online, that we may be able to hear your word spoken to us afresh and anew this morning. In your name do we pray. Amen. So our focus today, as we continue and wrap up our sermon series on the seven letters to the seven churches, is on two elements that we have more or less run by throughout the other sermons that we've been having on these texts. And these two elements are being conquerors, or some translations may say being overcomers, and hearing the Spirit. And specifically, we want to take a look at what it would have meant for the hearers of Revelation, and also we want to hear what it means for our lives as believers. And we begin with these lines just knowing and and recognizing that this formula is sort of repeated throughout every letter written to the seven churches found in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. And it goes something like this, to the one who conquers, such and such will be given. There, there is an, a reward, there is a heavenly reward, an eternal reward given to those who conquer. And the second element then is, let the churches hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, throughout these seven letters, those that formula kind of reverses and goes back and forth once in a while. Um, it doesn't really matter how the formula is expressed. It's just the fact that there are these two elements expressed, conquering and hearing. So what does it mean to conquer or to overcome, to be a conqueror or an overcomer? Well, Paige Patterson, in his New American Commentary on Revelation, pointed out to me that the probable meaning of conquering is actually found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, which means our focus is going to be on an eternal type of conquering and not on a conquering or overcoming of our present circumstances. Today we have our focus on the eternal elements because of Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 and if you turn there with me we'll see this verse 11 and they have conquered him by that Satan they have conquered him Satan and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death. And this is really rich for an understanding of how we conquer and how we indeed are overcomers. Now the context of Revelation 12 is is in a place where uh, a heavenly voice is now proclaiming the announcement that Satan or the devil has been defeated and thrown down from earth uh, to earth. God's kingdom and authority has now come to fruition. They have arrived, 
and the accuser has been thrown down, and right there in the middle, then we hear, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives, even unto death. This then has very specific spiritual and material applications for us in learning how to be conquerors, not over our present day circumstances perhaps, but overcoming Satan and the world in an eternal perspective. And the first reference, of course, is to Jesus and his work on the cross. They have conquered Satan or the devil by the blood of the Lamb. You see, right before here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, what you'll see is that the devil is called the accuser of our brothers and sisters. The accuser, the one who accuses them night and day before God. And right here we see what the enemy is doing. The enemy is actually playing on what is true about humanity because the problem has always been threefold for us as humans. Number one, the problem is the devil. Number two, the problem is sin. And number three, the problem is death. And all three of those relate to each other and can be found in Genesis chapter 3 right there at the beginning. Satan Devil, uh, devil, sin, death. And that's the issue that we all face. And here's the thing, the, the, the problem with this is that the accuser actually stands in the right for all unbelievers and all people who have not received the blood of the Lamb is that the accuser stands in the right because all are trapped under sin. All of us have done wrong. All of us have committed evil. All of us are sinners before God. And it takes the blood of the Lamb to wash us clean. The blood of the Lamb is a reference to the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. That the fact that he pleased God by his sacrifice, the fact that he took sin and the punishment for sin upon himself, the fact that he now washes us clean, that we can be forgiven because the right sacrifice has been made for on our behalf, the fact that we can be passed over in judgment, all of those metaphors kind of come out to play when we talk about the richness and the glory of the cross. That the blood of the Lamb makes atonement possible. And that he enables us to be forgiven by God. That he has allowed us and enabled us to be justified by God. The hardest work of overcoming and being a conqueror, and here's the secret, the hardest work is done by Jesus, not by us. The hardest work has already been taken care of by Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. But that's not the only thing that conquerors need. You see, the text in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You see, the word of their testimony then needs to be resolved. We need to figure out what this means and how it is linked to the blood of the Lamb. And here it is. The word of the testimony is somebody's faith placed fully in Christ for salvation. It is the person's own words and belief in the heart and in the mind that God has delivered them from sin and has put them into new life, has given them new life, has moved them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from death to life. This is the testimony that begins with placing faith in God and receiving his atoning work on our behalf. And it is more than mere words. It is a testimony of words that describes a life that has been given over fully to Jesus and has received this reconciliation that only he can give. It is a life marked by absolute loyalty to God and Jesus Christ. 
It is a life that bears fruit that only comes from Jesus Christ. It is about the unswerving, unerring loyalty to God and to Jesus that he is the only Savior, that he is our Savior, that he is the only God and he is our God, that he is worthy of our best. And it is to him and for him that we give our best, the best of our time, the best of our energy, the best of our years, the best of our money, the best of our talents, after we come to faith in him. Loyalty to God is crucial and critical for the saving work of Jesus Christ in our lives. You see, here's the thing. A faith-filled Person, somebody filled with faith in Jesus and, and has been reconciled with God and is now doing life with God cannot remain the same as they once were. Now, this in no way is about works uh, or salvation or works righteousness salvation or anything like that. No, no, there is no salvation outside of Jesus on the cross. All of somebody's so-called good works before they come to faith count for nothing. They count for nothing. It is like a dirty rag before God. The quote-unquote good things we do. No, no. And when somebody is um, grafted back into the olive tree of God, when somebody is connected to Jesus like a branch to a vine, they cannot help but bear good fruit. And that is what we are talking about when we're saying that the, the word of the testimony is backed up by a life. And the word of the testimony points to a life in which God has delivered, in which God has worked with and through and in a person. is one that bears fruit in that person's life. And here's the secret that is not so much of a secret for the most holy people you know, for those who have made the most progress in the Christian life, for those who have done the most for the kingdom of God is that it was not about them and it was not in their own strength and it was not in their own power. It was God working in them and through them and with them and for them and ultimately for his kingdom. This is the word of their testimony. The absolute loyalty to God which has resulted in a life lived with God that glorifies Him. It is a life made possible by the cross of Jesus Christ, by the resurrection of Christ, and by faith in Jesus. And this is the absolute loyalty and testimony because of the blood of the Lamb that enables the saints to love not their own lives even unto death. Love not their own lives. You see, they, the person who is filled with faith, the, the one who will conquer because of Jesus and the God, is one who is willing to give up their life for him. Whether it means a physical death, or whether it means crawling on the altar as a living sacrifice. Because here's the thing, there are some who are called. There are some who are called to ministry. There are some who are called to the mission fields. There are some who are called to give in such ways that it is tremendously sacrificial. There are things that people are called to do and that feel a weight and calling on their lives. That they will only do because they love not their own life, but they love Jesus and they know that he is worth it. And so they give up their life for him and for the sake of his call. How do we conquer and overcome throughout the letters of Revelation chapter 2 and chapters, chapters 2 and 3? We see that conquering then means conquering by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of their testimony, loving not their own lives even unto death. And that's just the first part that we need to understand. And with that, we also need to understand that in each of these letters, to the one who conquers is given a, an eternal reward. 
Now that's not our only focus today, although we'll be coming back to that in our practical section. The second focus for today is also Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's fascinating that Jesus is the speaker all throughout uh, these two chapters of Revelation. It is Jesus who is speaking these letters, but then he's also saying that the Spirit is speaking these same things. And when I was thinking about this, I I think it means this. I think it means that Jesus is speaking very, very clearly to these churches what the Spirit has been saying and continues to say to those churches so that there are two witnesses to what is being said by God to these seven churches in Revelation. And the questions that then should come to mind is, what has the Spirit said to the churches? What is the Spirit currently saying to the church? Why is the Spirit speaking to the churches? Have you ever thought about that in the context of Revelation? Have you ever thought about why the Spirit is speaking to the church? Here's the thing. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, wants and desires for God's kingdom to move forward, for Jesus to be glorified, for the Father to be glorified, and that means having as many people conquer this world and Satan as possible because that brings God glory. And it's not only about bringing God glory, it's also about the Spirit's love for us. For just as the Father loved us enough to send his his son into the world to die for us so the spirit has come and is now in us and is enabled to be in us by jesus because of the father's love because of jesus's love and because of the spirit's own love for us the spirit of god the holy spirit loves us And he desires for us to conquer because it glorifies God. And that is so crucial to understanding and it is absolutely correct that our conquering is not really about us even though it is. It's first and foremost about God. And it's first and foremost about his glory. And so the Spirit speaks to the churches. What is the Holy Spirit saying to the church? Three things were found in these letters. The first, repent. The second is carry on. And the third is endure, persevere. And we've seen throughout this sermon series on that topic those very things. Here are two items of repentance that stand out. First is a lack of love for God. Repent of a lack of love for God. We studied that with the Ephesus church at the beginning. That the Ephesus church was nearly perfect, except for this one glaring error, was that they had stopped loving God with the fervor that they had at first. And the second standout was cultural compromise. There were three churches rebuked, utterly rebuked, for compromising with culture by eating food sacrificed to idols, and by sexual immorality. Now, two churches were told to carry on. Two of seven churches were told to carry on because they were in such states of persecution. All they needed to do was hold fast to the testimony and continue to proclaim Jesus. And the third thing, all the churches were told to endure him. You see, in each of the churches that were told to to repent, there was a faithful remnant in each congregation that held fast to the name of Jesus. And to them, they were told to endure. To the two churches being persecuted, they were told to endure, to persevere. Enduring means bearing up, going on, keeping on, undergoing without failing for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that endurance is a huge part of the Christian life that is not talked about enough in our churches. Enduring is all over the New Testament. And so here uh, in, in this part of Revelation, it means this, 
Endure the loss of income and revenue. Endure the loss of reputation. Endure the loss of friends. Endure the loss of family. Endure the loss of, endure the mockery. Endure the loss of reputation. Endure the loss of suffering. Endure those who need to repent and are not repenting yet. Endure the hardship. Endure. The churches are called to endure the times that they are in, knowing that Jesus is worth it and better times are coming because of what Jesus has done. Endure. As we make the shift to our practical application, we need to begin here with what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And in our own lives then, since the Spirit was saying, repent, carry on, and endure. The two focuses for us are probably repenting and enduring, because carrying on just means carrying on. So let's talk about repenting and enduring. First, we need to repent. We need to examine our own lives for any area of repentance, whether it be from sin, from lack of love for God, And what has really hit home for me in this sermon series, the areas of cultural compromise. You see, cultural compromise is so subtle. And it can just worm its way in because isn't God just full of grace? Well, no, I don't necessarily need to do that specific thing that God wants me to do. Well, that text must not be for me even though it might be for everyone else. And the questions that then come to mind are, have we capitulated to culture? Are we on the verge of capitulating to culture? On our views of sexuality and abortion? On our views of of and the lifestyle of giving to the poor and accumulating wealth for self? Have we capitulated to the culture that says, get more for yourself at all costs? On how we use our time between pursuing God, tending to family and friends, serving God's cause, working in entertainment, is that in the right balance and proportion for our stage of life and our ability? How about on what we watch in television, on television and in movies, on what we allow to be streamed into our homes, on what we look at online? Are there areas where we have become numb, desensitized, and therefore go along thinking it is okay when it is not okay? See, the more that I do life with God and the longer I live, the more I realize and the more God points out to me my own areas of cultural compromise. And the more then that I need to give up in order to grab a hold of and obtain more of God and more of what he has. See, some things need to be given up even though they are not wrong or bad. Neither does Scripture even speak out against them. And yet, for the sake of God, some of those things need to be given up. Other things must be dropped because they don't help to make and cultivate a mind that is set on God and the things of God. Other things have simply need to be dropped, especially in my own life, they have been dropped. Because what was once funny 10 or 15 years ago, or oh, that's no big deal, 10 or 15 years ago, has now become disgusting, and, and there's a knowledge that, that those items and those things do not lead to the path of righteousness. And in our lives with God, we know that that is the case. And that is the process of maturing in Christ and becoming more like him. But that process does not stop at any point here in our lives on earth. My friends, my family, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Are we capitulating to culture and do we need to repent thereof? And the second thing that the Spirit is saying to the churches currently is endure. 
Sometimes we don't talk about enduring enough because for whatever reason, we think enduring is the opposite of joy, and it's not. There can be joy even in the midst of enduring, especially when we're doing it with God. But for some reason, we have in our mind just a a gritting the jaw and, and bearing up and sweating and toil as the only picture of endurance. And indeed, that is right. But you know what? When we're enduring, we're in the yoke with Jesus Christ, and that yoke is easy and the burden is light it's a joyful enduring even in the midst of tremendous hardship and suffering and we don't talk about enduring the christian life nearly enough you see instead we like to focus on positive things you know there's a a song by elevation church right now or elevation worship group And um, part of the lyrics say this, I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory because the battle belongs to you, Lord. And at one sense, I want to say absolutely yes and amen. And and it's very, very true in one sense. And yet in the other sense, I think that that song is, is missing the enduring part of the suffering. The enduring that only the Lord can bring. Because perhaps the Lord won't bring the victory over our current everyday circumstance. Perhaps the only victory we will see is the eternal victory. You see, the Israelites, when they were trapped in Egypt under slavery, they were there for 400 years. The people of Israel had to endure until God delivered them in God's timing. Between the Old Testament, the last prophet in the Old Testament, and the beginning of the New Testament with Jesus is approximately 400 years. The people of Israel and this whole world had to endure the waiting for the Messiah. 400 years since God spoke, until God moved, and until God delivered. And sometimes it is the same way for our own suffering. Sometimes we need to just endure, knowing that the fruits of the Christian life, the fr- the end time, the, the fruits of the overcoming the circumstance may not happen in our generation, but 10 generations from now. But we are still called to endure. Your life with God right now may seem boring and maybe there's not much to it and yet you are called to endure you are being persecuted for your faith which in america kind of we lose use persecution loosely in america sometimes it just means being mocked for our faith well yes maybe that's persecution but at the same time that's not nearly what other people in the world are going through but if you're being persecuted for your faith endure You're undergoing medical trials. Endure. You're giving to the poor but finding yourself with some financial difficulties and struggles. Endure. You are suffering from the bombardment of temptation and sin. Endure. You are drained and tired from the events of this life and can't seem to move on for the kingdom of God. Hang on, get rest, and... Endure, endure for the name of Christ and for the sake of Christ. Persevere, hang on, bear up. And we endure because we will conquer. And the internal conquering is the one that must stick. We'll conquer the devil and the world by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Perhaps even unto the point of giving up our lives for the sake of the gospel. But the ultimate rewards will be yours and ours. Eating from the tree of life, unhurt by the second death, receiving hidden manna and a white stone, receiving the morning star, being clothed in white, written in the book of life, made a pillar in the temple of God, sitting with God on his throne meaning sharing the rule of God forever, the blessed hope and sure reward of eternal life for those who conquer with Christ. My friends, let us think this week and practice thereon in conquering and hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your grace and your love. Holy Spirit, now we pray that you would be with us at all times. Lord Jesus, bring us on. Help us to conquer in your name. Father God, help us to repent and endure. And may we be open to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In your name do we pray. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us go in the name of Jesus Christ.